Good evening. This is QTV News. I am Maria Masan and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. An operative with the NIA has revealed to the TRC that ex-president Jammer was prepared to pay 10,000 euros for fabricated evidence against the former chief of defense staff of the armed forces. Sheikh Isa Fodi Dabo has been selected as president of the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council to succeed the outgoing president Al Haji Muhammad Lamin Touré. Forest tree officials at the Brikama Kabafi to Forest Park blame reckless smokers and mentally disturbed people for causing the recent fire outbreak that destroyed parts of the forest. In international news, a year after the first COVID-19 link that was confirmed in China, we look back at what that has meant for the world. In sports news, we hear about the return of league football following the COVID-19 enforced shutdown. And Africa's first major men's football tournament is only a matter of days away as Cameroon gears up to host the sixth edition of the biggest competition for footballers playing their football in Africa. Those were our main headlines, now the local news in detail. Omar Cham, an NIA operative on Monday, told the TRRC that Yaya Cham paid up to 10,000 euros to people to fabricate stories and testify against the Lang Tombong Tambar, the former chief of defense staff of the Gambian army. Cham went further to confirm that the NIA headquarters used to be a torture ground. Babu Karsi heard the testimony. The witness Omar Cham has been adversely mentioned as a torturer by various witnesses at the commission and appeared on Monday to shed light on his role as an NIA officer during the former regime and response to the allegations against him. He began his testimony with a rundown of his education background, his enrollment into the gendarmerie, who specialized in anti-terrorism and criminology studies in Turkey before he was declared unfit to serve due to health reasons two years later. The witness said he applied to join the NIA and was successful to begin to operate as an NIA operative in 1996. Omar Cham told the Truth Commission that the NIA is a torture place and any person that worked as an NIA officer during those days and denied having knowledge of tortures at the place is given false information. Hey, by the Mimi Mawande Noma, not the gold on Tan Horemum Tan Nataji Bernam, the Mehorum now has a heavy psychological gut effects. Yes, and not of torture. Yes, one day I'm wounded and I can why what day. Yes, because as I said before, even to call somebody to come and answer there. Is really scary. It can even shock a person when you are told to come and answer there. So this is why I said even uh, uh, calling somebody to come to the place uh, is unpalatable. When asked by the lead counsel to explain how the NIA dealt with a person arrested and a case of breaking the law or deemed to be a threat to Jamaica's government, this was the witness's response. Most of the time, mostly you are, you are, you are, you are, you are. You are going to be maltreated in most cases you are going to be maltreated you are likely to be maltreated in most cases yes the witness went further to make some serious revelations that ex-president yaya jame paid 10,000 euros to some individuals to testify against lantom montamba the former cds to implicate him in a coup plot so that's how you knew that ryu jabi gasama and uh, his colleagues were bribed 10,000 euro each to incriminate Lang Tombong Tamba. You want to know under that one, the Mao Rui Jabi Gasamajo, John Nama Duk Odukama, Guluji Sapo Hero, Puru Owa Nad in the Bay, Tarungo Imur Eya Jam. You call them because Kodum Benvi, Dumko Hezuam. Yes, that's what happened, and that's what Ben said, and it was in my presence. He confirmed that the state used to pay people money to falsely testify against people that the state wanted to eliminate and gave examples of the cases of Lantombong Tamba and Esa Baji Jesus. The witness said a lot of cases which resulted in people, including top government officials, being incarcerated were made up, resulting in the imprisonment of many. On the issue of the killing of journalist Deda Haidara, the witness said the police were responsible for the investigation on the matter but said that they did not do much and the pressure continued to mount from the public for an investigation leading to the matter being transferred to the NIE. They the, what, that big impression what, that how they are going to handle this diligently and make sure that you know uh, the truth is established. Everything surrounding his death 
will be, will be investigated and known. That was just an impression. It was false. But nothing, nothing, nothing genuine was done. On physical tortures that had happened at the NIA, the witness denied witnessing or involving in tortures. He, however, confirmed that all torture sessions took place at night, but denied that he tortured Esabaji. After a long push and pull with the lead counsel, the witness finally accepted one torture, but forgot or could not remember the others he was involved in. He, however, accepted that he has committed human rights violations, and if he is not given amnesty, he can be prosecuted. Babu Karsi, QTV News. 105 delegates comprising 15 imams from each administrative region across the country gathered on Sunday to elect a new president for the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council at its fifth congress. Sheikh Isa Fodi Daba was selected to succeed the outgoing president, Al Haji Muhammad Lamin Touri. Lolly M. Kamara has more. Sheikh Isa Fode Dabo was elected president of the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council on Sunday and expected to serve for five years. In the electoral process, he gained 89 of the votes ahead of Sheikh Mohammed Lamin Kante, who gained 11 votes, and Sheikh Cherno Dabo, who gained five. The new president explains his plans to strengthen unity among Muslims. My main priority is uh, unity of Muslim Ummah especially Muslims in this country, uh, particularly imams and the Islamic scholars. Uh, we'll do our level best to bring everyone on board and to strengthen dialogue and consultations so that we understand each other. We all belong to one religion, and the religion is clear. The basic principles of religion, Islam, is one. So there is no room for misunderstanding. But I think that will, will be solved through the you know, consultation, inshallah. Seh Dabo also outlined some of the challenges faced by the Supreme Islamic Council, among which is permanent funding for the council. To involve Gambians to raise funds in running the Supreme Islamic Council. Because we cannot rely on the outside the countries. As Muslims, 95% of Muslims, it is our responsibility to feel ownership of this uh, super Islamic Council and we raise necessary funds in running the, the, the super Islamic Council because the super Islamic Council for the Gambians, especially Muslims, is very, very important. He thanked the Muslim Omar for the trust bestowed upon him and advised Muslims and non-Muslims to look forward to the future and forget the past and to always maintain mutual respect and foster unity. Let's all you know, respect each other, respect different, uh, different views, and then come together and work for the uh, benefit of our Muslims and also work for the development of our country. And... Uh, uh, try to establish peace in this country so that all the Gambians, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, live together as we, we, we ask our ancestors we are, we, are, we are living in this country in peace, inshallah. According to his biography, Seh Isa Fodidabo is a native of Gunjur in Kombo South from a prominent religious and political family. He is also a linguist, writer, preacher, and a graduate of the College of Arabic Language and Islamic Studies at the Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia. In 1986, Seh Isa obtained a BA degree in Arabic Language and Islamic Studies at the Islamic University, and he was the first Gambian student to graduate from that university. He has also held the position of Deputy Secretary General in Council in the 90s. And until his election as President, he was a member in the Advisory Committee of the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council. For QTV News, Lolly M. Kamara. Forestry officials at the Bekama Kabafita Forest Park have blamed reckless smokers and mentally disturbed people for causing the fire outbreak that destroyed parts of the Kabafita Forest. Our reporter Omar P. Jalo visited the scene and this is his report. Outbreaks of bush fires are frequent during this time of the year because of the availability of dry grass and strong wind. 
This can lead to a serious environmental problems to humans, plants, and animals. The Birkama Kabafita Forest is said to be among the biggest parks in the West Coast region and is home to various plants and animal species. The park covers 243 hectares and the area was established as a forest park in 1954. Fire outbreaks at the Birkama Kabafita Forest has now become an annual occurrence. Omar Sidibe is the head of Birkama Kabafita Forest Plantation Section. This was observed by one of my patrol men called Yankuba Duganda. He was just on his normal patrol. Suddenly he passed that zone and uh, within a minute of his turning back, then he saw fire. Even today we were having a brief discussion. I think you can be a witness of that. You meet me with my guys, we were talking about this issue. So this guy really irritated that this fire that he saw, really speaking, he cannot say how it happens. Uh, it can be, according to people in our local terms, it can be fire of Satan. Sidibe also spoke on the indiscriminate dumping of waste and illegal logging in the forest, adding that the public should be sensitized on the consequences of bushfires. It's going to be, let everybody take the environment as a key issue in our lives, because as one of our slogans in forestry, no tree, no life. And presently, as I told you, within the urban area, all are dependent on this forest cover. So automatically, we should all try by all means and uh, deceive from causing fire within this area. City Bay further stated that the protection of the forest and its inhabitants should be the primary responsibility of every citizen and call for attitudinal change. Normally, stated that they have nowhere to do their dumping and uh, normally the councils who are responsible for waste are not collecting waste from their side. So it's a matter of timing. They normally time us as we time to cut them up. But it's hard really to cut them up for them to come. But this illegal dumping, the bottom line is, is the population. He acknowledged that the foresters and fire service need to work together to contribute towards the containment of bushfires and urge the government to take actions against those responsible for causing bushfires. Some have suggested that sound environmental policies and regulatory framework like creating local anti-bush fire committees and ensuring that local authorities in all over the country work with forestry officials in tackling bushfires could be a great advantage. What remains clear is that unless stronger surveillance, monitoring and enforcement are in place, bushfires will continue to be a serious problem. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. We will take a short break and still to come, we have local, international and sports news. Welcome back. The Bay Canyon Badin Bung Initiative over the weekend held its first peace reconciliation interface, bringing together over 30 victims of human rights violations and some of their preparators during the former regime. The story by Fodemani is narrated by Lolly M. Kamara. These victims suffered various human rights violations, are all natives of Wooly West. The interface Bantaba was attended by regional authorities, chiefs, alcalos, national assembly members, religious leaders, women and youth leaders. The victims got the opportunity to narrate some of their stories, while some of their perpetrators also had the chance to seek forgiveness from them. At the conclusion, the aim of the event was achieved when the victims accepted to forgive their perpetrators. While narrating some of the human rights violations he encountered for his political affiliation with the PDOIS party during the Jame regime, Sehu Jaune of Sutukondin said, due to severe torture he was subjected to by the police, his health has been severely affected. 
e mitino ke barokunda wulli barokunda talata lungula hanim bia manyina lungula talato le ya agreemento city je ko e fero ke muta when they had a meeting in wulli barokunda on a tuesday they agreed to arrest me and on the Thursday i was arrested when i was taken to the station every night at 12 midnight the police would torture me since then my health has been affected my chest and my entire body pains but i would love to appear before the trrc to narrate my own story hawa ture another victim from kuwankundim village shared her story Hawa said one of her sons was arrested and detained at the Basi police station for 72 hours after being falsely accused of attempted murder. She said the arrest came after she had an argument with one of the rich men in her village who was an APRC supporter. She also said that her second son was involved in a similar scenario and his hand cut off. Hawa said because of these events, she decided to encourage both her two sons to leave the country through the so-called back way. The executive director of Bay Kanyang, Famara Jaune, said the event is significant to the victims who do not have the opportunity to appear before the TRRC, as they can reconcile and establish peace through the traditional way called Badimbong. Bringing together victims of human rights violation. Uh, who do not have the opportunity so far to appear before the TRRC to have another option of narrating their own stories through the Badimbung initiative of Bekanyang. At the same time, they are doing this in the presence of their abusers. Some of their abusers, I mean the perpetrators themselves, are also around. So we are using the traditional way of um, addressing some of these problems, but uh, in trying to bring together the victims of human rights violations, as well as the um, perpetrators, so that uh, they have the opportunity to narrate their own stories, but at the same time, those who, in one way or the other, contributed to the violations of their rights will hear them and then have the opportunity to accept the fact that indeed they, they, they were the ones who were responsible for their predicaments and uh, seek for their forgiveness and we nurture peace, unity, and then move into the next stage of reconciliation. For QTV News, Lolly M. Kamara. A 24-year-old man was diagnosed with a kidney disorder needs urgent overseas treatment. Jane Basanko visited the patient at his residence to understand the patient's challenges and needs. Pa Samba Jawa has been battling with this cancer disorder since 2016, just after graduating from high school. Samba suffers from nephrotic syndrome, a kidney disorder that causes the body to pass too much protein in the urine. Nephrotic syndrome is usually caused by damage to the clusters of small blood vessels in the kidneys that filter waste and excess water from your blood. Samba's condition has now reached the final stage of the condition and doctors say he requires urgent overseas treatment because he requires a kidney transplant and he currently depends on dialysis. Samba aspires to be a business management major at the University of the Gambia, but his condition has made this dream seem futile since he graduated from high school. It's really not easy. It's never easy. Being on medication itself is not easy, especially when you have in mind that you're dealing with a life-threatening um, illness, you know, it's not. It's never easy. You have to be physically strong as 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 well as mentally to be able to deal with it. Yeah, but I had to stood strong because of many reasons, you know. Yeah. So, Alhamdulillah. Anyway, I'm having a dialysis every two three days. I have my dialysis. Dado Jawa, past Amber's elder sister, says the journey has been a very troubling one, and they have done everything they can to make sure her brother regains his health, but efforts have so far proved futile. She says that as a family, they have now decided to turn to the public to request support for her brother to get the overseas treatment he needs as they can't achieve this on their own. I'm appealing to everyone. It's been hard. It's been tough with the pandemic and everything, but he really needs help. He really needs help because um, the 
a fistula surgeon in Dakar, Dr. Miguela, told me that he really needs help. We are appealing to the government and to everyone. He needs help. He re needs help right now. That's the only thing that I know. She adds that the high cost of buying heparin, a drug necessary for Parsambas dialysis every two or three days, at a cost of 1500 is difficult for the family. Pasamba is a strong-willed and has a strong personality and is currently in high spirits. Fortunately, there's already a kidney donor who is a match for Pasamba and a hospital in Turkey and India have already been identified as possible destinations for the operation and are in constant communication with the family. The only thing missing now is the funding to take the patient there for the transplant to be conducted. Uh, to the public, people, individuals, companies, you know, and everybody out there who is a bit stable and, I mean, can offer help to any type of medical situation that people are facing, you know, not only me, but a lot of people. But the fact that, um, particularly, I'm involved here, so it's just what I'm just saying to the people out there is like they should look back, you know, and then try to help people, you know, who are in need. Yeah, especially people who are struggling with their lives, you know, trying to find it difficult to to get their stability due to medical problems. Pasamba is one of the 750 million persons worldwide suffering from kidney disease. The burden of kidney disease varies substantially across the world, as it does in its detection and treatment. In many settings, rates of kidney disease and the provision of its care are defined by socio-economic, cultural and political factors, leading to significant disparities. If anyone would like to assist, please contact QTB to help Pasama Jawa, a young aspiring business management major, fulfill his dream. Please write to news at qtb.gm. Reporting for QTB News, I am Jenna Wasonko. The general manager of the Gami National Beekeepers Association at the Brikamanya My Office is concerned about the indiscriminate looting and destruction of all forests by woodcutters for timber exploitation. As this endangers the lives of bees, Amar Pijalo went to meet him. In an exclusive interview with QTV, the general manager of the Gambia National Beekeepers Association, Siaka Manga, said his association is committed to providing training for young unemployed people to become beekeepers and sell honey to hotels, among other places. He said this will help to protect the native African honeybee, which is essential to food crop pollination and the overall ecological balance in the country. Manga said over the years, the association has trained many farmers nationwide in building hives, site selections, harvesting honey, wax processing, packaging, marketing, business skills and value-added productions. He adds that after training people, they support them with materials such as beehives and other beekeeping materials to start honey production for income generation and better living. If you look around, you'll see all those um, boxes called hives where we have to introduce the bees to come and colonize those um, boxes. Then from there, um, you know, we'll condition them to produce honey for us. That is um, quality honey that uh, we produce for our own uh, consumption and also for um, the, the, the population of this country. Anga also reveals that under his leadership, the profit from honey sales has been used to erect some of the buildings at the Birkama Nyambai office. He adds that they currently manage over 45 colonies of beehives and have orders owned and managed by individual members throughout the country. Manga, however, appeals to the government and other partners for assistance with funds to develop more hives and to train more people. He said the issue of beekeeping in other countries is high on their country's development agenda, saying some countries even have schools where beekeepers are trained. Manga believes that beekeeping as a business can help cope the issue of irregular migration and unemployment among the youths. Most of the bees are killed by using those traditional hives. So that's why these modern you know, hives, they are, these hives you are looking at, they are modern, where you can be harvesting your honey without killing bees, you will have more honey, you have more beeswax that are now an income yield. We use them for marketing. So 
Definitely, um, it's, 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 a good, it's, a, it's a good job that we are, we, we are doing. And a farmer, a poor farmer today, you come, you see our records, you'll see a poor farmer coming here and then casting about 25, 30,000 of, 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 of $30, from the money, uh, from the honey they are producing. So really, it's an income generating activity. On the importance of bees, Manga said their survival is very important for the world, adding that bees assist greatly in pollination of plants which helps in the continuation of different plant species, saying without pollination, many plants will not produce and most plant species will not survive. He, however, lamented the indiscriminate looting and destruction of our forests by woodcutters for timber exploitation, adding if the activity goes unchecked, the lives of bees will be endangered, which could be disastrous for the world. Manga also urges the Ministry of Environment in particular the forestry department, to be mindful of forest fires and its devastating effects on the forest as the home for insects and other animals. He said most of the country's forest cover has been lost to bush fires and this has caused the migration of the bee population to greener regions in the sub-region because of their habitat and plants that they feed on has been destroyed by forest fire. On the economic benefits of beekeeping, Manga said Gambian honey is organic and pure and is wanted as far away as Europe, adding the honey production and the sale of honey products is increasing business for farmers in the country. Uh, year 2017 up to date, there are no sponsors coming inside. So it is through this sponsorship that we have and then we mobilize more youths, men and women to come and attend training here. Then we buy uh, no, materials like beeswax, uh, uh, no, no, boxes, and then uniform, overall, everything, every, every, all those necessary materials for beekeeping, we buy and supply them each so that they can go and start. The National Beekeepers Association of the Gambia is a non-profit organization dedicated to promoting beekeeping for the production of 100% pure Gambian honey, as well as honey wax cream. The association works to increase the livelihoods of rural communities by training and giving support to small-scale farmers on beehive care and how to be more productive. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. In international news, January 11 marked the first anniversary of China confirming its first death from a new virus in Wuhan. A 61-year-old man who was a regular customer of the now infamous Wuhan wet market. Linked to many of the early cases, Mamadoum Bosch looked back at the COVID era. The world would soon become grimly familiar with the disease that killed him as COVID-19, an acronym that stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019, so named by the WHO exactly one month after the first reported death. By that point, the disease had spread around the world and deaths outside of China had begun to occur, first in the Philippines. In China itself, deaths had reached more than a thousand, with just under 43,000 infections recorded. On January 30th, the WHO declared COVID-19 a global emergency. Egypt became the first country in Africa to report a case on Valentine's Day, 14th of February, the same day France reported Europe's first death from the virus. Sub-Saharan Africa in March recorded its first COVID-19 death, a high-ranking politician in Burkina Faso, as the head of the World Health Organization urged the continent to prepare for the worst. By March 6th, more than 100,000 cases have been recorded around the world. And on March 11th, the WHO says COVID-19 is a pandemic. The Gambia recorded its first case on 17th of March. A woman in her 30s who had travelled to the Gambia from the United Kingdom. The second case was the country's first fatality. A 70-year-old itinerant Bangladeshi preacher who had arrived in the Gambia from Senegal. On 2nd April, more than 3.9 billion people, half of the world's population, are forced or called on to confine themselves. The same day, the threshold of 1 million cases is crossed. As infections around the world spiraled out of control, countries raced to slow the spread of the virus by testing and treating patients, carrying out contact tracing, limiting travel, 
quarantining citizens, cancelling large gatherings, closing schools, colleges and universities, shops, restaurants and bars. Campaigns on mask wearing, social distancing and hand washing kicked into action. The measures upended lives and derailed the global economy. In January, President Trump praised China's tackling of the developing crisis. By April, however, the U.S., among a number of other countries, raised questions about whether China was fully transparent when the virus first emerged there. Trump was globally condemned for referring to the China virus and his administration's promotion of the conspiracy theory that China created it in a lab, which scientists reject. The WHO has also come under fire from Trump, who withdrew the U.S.'s contribution to the world body. The world reached the grim milestone of a million deaths worldwide on September 28, and by the following month and through the rest of the year, more waves and new variants, more virulent than others, were being recorded in the UK and other parts of Europe, South America and Brazil, leading to new lockdowns and curfews. This has been happening even as nations in Europe have rolled out vaccines, Britain being the first Western nation to start vaccinating. At the beginning of the pandemic, the world had feared the worst for Africa. But as it happened, Africa has so far been spared the worst effects of the disease. However, we've entered 2021 as full of uncertainty as we entered 2020. For QTV News, I am Mamoudou Mbouj. In sports news... After 10 months without a competitive football league, the GFF has announced that national league competitions are set to resume in the midweek for the first and second divisions. According to the governing body, the league will be played with strict COVID-19 measures observed throughout. Baba Karsi has the rest of that story. Football may have returned in other countries for months despite the lack of fun in the stadiums. But in the Gambia, there has been until now a continuous embargo on sporting activities as a result of the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, after more than 10 months of uncertainty dating back to the abortion of the domestic football campaign in early 2020, Gambian fans can now look forward to their favorite teams playing each other every week. The season is set to get underway on Wednesday with four Division II fixtures across various venues. Ahead of the resumption of the league, club managers in both the fourth and second division, male and female, on Sunday, converged at the Technical Training Center in Yundum, where they were reminded of the rules guiding the Gambia National League with strict COVID-19 precautions. Speaking to me after the end of the half-day session, the GFF's second vice president, Ibu Fai, began by setting out the reasons for the decision to increase the league price money from $300,000 to $750,000 for the league champions. In the female first division, the price money for the champions will rise from $150,000 to four hundred thousand dollars well it's a combination of a lot of things but the major thing was you know government have decided to take over financing of national teams so we are able to save something to able to give back to clubs because uh, uh, we have been stuck with, with, with the amount we are giving three hundred thousand now need us move up to first division seven hundred thousand so at least it will help and hopefully when we get a sponsor uh, if it's possible we'll able to increase the amount more because definitely our football deserve more consolation prizes because the team spends too much when it comes to preparation for, for, for the season. As advised by our medical committee and also through our uh, consultation with the Minister of Health to make sure that you know we meet the required standard of COVID-19. That's testing of players, temperature testing, hand wash, face mask and so on and so forth. You know, we meet the... Uh, the required measures and protocols as, as, as we are in a very, very difficult situation now with the COVID-19. With the football season resuming on Wednesday and Saturday respectively, what will happen if the country goes for another lockdown due to COVID-19? For example, if there is a second wave, here is the second vice president, Fai again. If government announces everything stops again until everything is safe again for us to restart. One issue that was raised during the club management meeting was that of referees. As club managers pleaded with the referees committee to schedule fit and experienced referees in the games. Responding to those fears of the managers, 
Bubakar Jalo, a senior referee instructor, insists that all the referees appointed to officiate in the national leagues are up to the task, capable and fully trained. Refereeing here, uh, anybody who gets involved in refereeing is just because of passion. It's just because of passion. They say, you know, it is not easy to referee, especially in the Gambia. It's not easy. We all pass through. It's very, very difficult because some of the time people are very, very, very aggressive. You see, and what they should understand, these referees come from families. Some of them have children, some of them have, you know, their wives and what they So if you openly abusing them like that, and if a referee leaves, that it has an impact. Because how many years would it take to develop a referee? How many years did it take us to develop Papa? Yes, we are not saying these referees don't make mistakes. But I can swear that there is no referee in the Gambia who will intentionally do anything to a team because he has a grievance against a team or against a coach or against no. That one I can always, uh, you know, suck even to put my life on the line. The men's league starts on Wednesday and Saturday, but unfortunately there is no date scheduled yet for the resumption of women's football, neither a draft fixture, despite the teams already going through intensive training and taking part in friendlies. I spoke to the team representative of Future BFC, Momodu Demba. Last season, as you know, we're doing up to our first round, we're entering to the second round. Then this pandemic came, everything had to cut off. Then all the girls were so relaxed, they are not doing anything, no active activity. So this year, um, things are showing up that um, it's likely the league will go on. Female football is always during the weekend, because most of, 90% of the female players, they are all going to school. So you cannot schedule them on Tuesday and Monday, it's not possible. Even Friday is always difficult for, 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 for a girl child to go and play football, because some of them go into the afternoon. So that's why the schedules are noted out. But they make a strong promise um, by the end of February, Serkunda is Serkunda is Bakau will be ready, then uh, most, some of the matches can be scheduled in those areas. Steve Biko will be amongst the early favorites for a return to the top flight after a few years in the second tier and will get their campaign underway with a home fixture against Jara West in a match to be played at the Independent Stadium in Bakau at the Live Your Dream Sports Academy football ground in Basori. There will be a meeting between former first division sides Bombarda and Samga Football Club as the two teams seek to avoid an early setback in their quest for a return to the elite ranks of Gambian football. The final match of the day will be played at the Jara Summer Mini Stadium where B4U Kiang West will host Red Hawks. Babu Karsi, QTV News. Continental Football Authorities and Cameroon's Football Administrator has been joining up for the start of the Total African Nations Championship, Chan 2020 tournament, the biggest competition for footballers playing their football in Africa. Adedarami tells us more. As the major football tournament taking place in Africa this year, there were fears that fans, a major and colorful event of every African tournament, would be absent from this year's tournament in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic. However, yesterday, Cameroon Sports Ministry announced plans to allow fans to attend the matches. The tournament has already felt the impact of the pandemic, as it was initially scheduled for April 2020, but will now take place between January 16 to February 7 of this year in four cities across the Central African nation. African football's governing body, CAF, recently gave the green light for fans to be allowed to access stadiums for the competition, after the country showed excellent management of the spread of the coronavirus. So far, Cameroon has had 26,848 cases since the outbreak of the coronavirus in the country in March 2020. There have been 448 deaths and currently they hold only 1,500 cases active from a population of over 25 million people. And according to Cameroon's sports ministry, up to 25% of fans will be allowed into stadiums for the group stages. This means that up to 12,000 fans of the 50,000 capacity will be present at the Japomo Stadium, the biggest capacity stadium to host games. Meanwhile, a little over 10,000 fans will be in attendance at matches played at the Stad Amadou Ahijo in Yaoundé and only 5,000 will be allowed to access the 20,000-seater Limbe Stadium, the smallest capacity stadium. The competition's first edition was in 2009, and this will be the sixth. 
Two-time winners DR Congo are the only team to have won it more than once, emerging victorious in 2009 and 2016. Libya and Tunisia have only won it, as have Morocco, who won it the last time around in 2018. Since the 2014 tournament, those taking part have been considered full internationals. This upcoming tournament will see 16 teams taking part. And although several African football powerhouses are absent, including Nigeria, Senegal, Algeria, Egypt and South Africa, there are four groups of four that all appear evenly balanced. Following a colourful launch event where draws were made, the Cameroon football authorities have been trying to drum up domestic support for the tournament. They have done a tour of the country with the tournament mascot Tara, which has drawn huge crowds. Part of trying to make the tournament inclusive for all Cameroonians is that the country is in the midst of an insurgency pitting the Anglophone part of the country against the mainly Francophone central government. Some of those in support of the English-speaking region have accused the central government of atrocities against their community and have called for a boycott of the tournament. On the pitch, the tournament will be the first major men's competition on the continent to see VAR technology deployed. CAF has also announced the list of referees who will officiate during the tournament. The Gambia's Abdul Aziz Bolel Jawo will be among the assistant referees, and Gambia's most well known referee, Papa Gassama, will be among those monitoring the VAR technology. For the first time at this competition, there will be female referees officiating during senior men's matches in Africa. The women chosen include senior referee Lydia Tafese Abebe of Ethiopia and three assistant referees with one each from Malawi, Nigeria and Cameroon. This will be the third major men's competition to have female match officials after the total under-17 Africa Cup of Nations in Tanzania in 2019 and the total under-23 Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt also in 2019. Host Cameroon hope to put up a good showing and their coach has already announced a 33-man squad of whom 10 are reserves. We are all looking forward to an exciting tournament. Reporting for QTV News, I am Ari Darami. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. An operative with the NIA has revealed to the TRRC that ex-president Jammer was prepared to pay 10,000 euros for fabricated evidence against the former chief of defense staff of the armed forces. Sheikh Issa Fouli Dabo has been selected as president of the Gambia Supreme Islamic Council to succeed the outgoing president, al Haji Mohamed Lamin Touré. Forestry officials at the Brikamu Kabafita Forest Park has blamed reckless smokers and mentally disturbed people for causing the recent fire outbreak that destroyed parts of the forest. In international news, a year after the first COVID-19 linked death was confirmed in China, we look back at what that has meant for the world. In sports news, we heard about the return of league football following the COVID-19 enforced shutdown. And Africa's first major men's football tournament is only a matter of days away as Cameroon gears up to host the sixth edition of the biggest competition for footballers playing their football in Africa. That's all we have for you in this edition of the QTV News. Do join us at 10 p.m. for another edition. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.